Sisters. Melancholia. Yes, you do have touches of it too. I do. And did your sojourn in India uh, and all of that do anything to help you on that? Uh, yeah, it, I, it kind of, it helped me deal with it really. How? Well, I just kind of asked myself, um, you know, normally depression is, is accompanied by a, a, a stream of thought. And I just kind of asked myself, like, is this a fact? This thought that I'm having yes. that's depressing me, is yeah. it a fact? And if it wasn't a fact, then I felt that I could just put it aside. But I needed to look at it first. If I didn't look at it, then it just went on like a song that I couldn't get out of my head. Uh, the reason I asked you was that I obviously some bits and pieces about you and you're quoted as saying that you live each day not only as if it were your last but you are in fact learning how to die which struck me as an extraordinary thing to say if you did say that <laughs> yeah I did say that I often say these things to reporters you know <laughs> I think yeah but uh, what I meant was that I I think that it's as we don't know when we're going to go, you know, as we don't know when our time is up, that I found it kind of practical to live my life as though it were my last day. Yes, that's fair enough. So it's something that I keep in mind. And I feel that as regards learning how to die, I think that I have a feeling that, that you know, we are not just this body. I think that like when we're in this body, we identify with the body and we feel that we're a separate entity. I think that there's a, it seems to me, a good chance that when we lose the body, we become something else, you know. Is this into reincarnation now or something? Not really other? into reincarnation, but I think that there's a kind of a consciousness. There's, there's like, there's a sense that, that we are. That when we wake up in the morning, it's different from being asleep. When we wake up, we, we know we are, you know, we exist. And I feel that that, that kind of field of consciousness is, um, is not separate. I think that that consciousness in me and that consciousness in you is not separate. Okay, you, because you have everything to live for, you, you now know more than your old pal Michael Caine, you've been described as a natural writer and you're certainly turning them out. Is it, is it going to be writing now for you from here on? Um, well, I don't know. The thing, is about, the thing is about the act, the difference between the acting and the writing is that with the acting, I feel that I have, you know, almost 30 years of craft, really. So if it's not coming to me, if I'm not particularly inspired, then I have the craft to fall back on and I can I can deliver. Um, I don't really have a, that kind of craft with the writing, so I'm still very much subject to whether it's striking me or not. So it, it I mean, it has struck me, and I've written books, and, and I feel um, a, a sense of well-being when I'm writing, when it's going well. You actually enjoy the act? I actually, I enjoy all, all parts of the writing, you know? I enjoy... It's a way of um, it's a way of being alone without being lonely. Mm -hmm. It's a way of being collected with yourself, mm -hmm. and I enjoy it. But it's not something that I feel I own. I don't. I would be lying if I said to you, "Oh, tomorrow I'm going to start a, another book, or I'm going to construct a bestseller." You know, like some writers say. The ten years that you opted out of and you had the roller and you're doing extraordinarily well and you're making, you're very much in demand and all of that, the ten years, was that, was that a waste, Terence, or, or was it very constructive for you? The success? The ten years, no, the ten years that you took out. Oh, the, the ten the years that I took out. You went away. Yeah, um, yeah no, absolutely. I, I think that uh, it, was, it was a great kind of investment, really, because when I became famous, um, you know, as a child, and being brought up rather poor, yes. Um, then I imagined that I felt kind of uh, happy and um, um, unhappy and unprivileged because I didn't have money, because I didn't have clothes, etc. And then when I became um, well known and had lots of money and had everything, um, it didn't really answer anything for me. 
it didn't really give me anything, any kind of permanent sense of satisfaction. The Rolls Royce and the trappings and yes, all of that. Yes, so when, so when kind of, um, you know, when heartache struck, as it were, uh, all those things didn't help me out. What was the heartache? This was Gene Shrimpton, was it? Yes. Yes. It was Gene Shrimpton. You really loved Gene Shrimpton. Um, yes. And, and when I lost her, then that also coincided with my career taking a dip. You know, the 60s was kind of ending. Mm -hmm. I was very heavily identified with the 60s, and so Indeed. I kind of ended with them. And I didn't have any, all the stuff I had didn't really give me any support. It didn't really make any difference, and that was a big shock. And so the, this, the 10 years, which I have to say, I had no idea going to be that it long. Going to be <laughs> um, I just was kind of, you know, I went in search of something. But of course, when you leave your country of origin, you leave everything familiar. You're in a very strange place where customs are different. You don't know anybody. You are thrown very much on yourself. And then you, and then you start seeing the flaws. And then you start seeing maybe the things that are wrong in your life are wrong with you, and they're just reflected outwardly. And so I guess that's something I gained. And though it's easy to say, it was, it was difficult to live. And uh, Jean Shrimpton, we remember her well, a most beautiful, beautiful woman, and, and uh, you really needed her at that time. And did she go off to marry somebody else? Is that... um, no, I think she just got fed up with got me. Got fed up with you, yeah. and that was it? Yeah. That was it. And once girls make it, I think, I think what actually happens is I think that if a girl is kind of um, involved with a guy um, and it's not going right, it takes an awful lot for a woman to just decide, I'm going to leave this guy. But once they do, then I think that's it. Then, then you can't get them back. You know? And has there nobody, never been anybody else in your life who meant as much as she did? Um, there have been other people in my yes, life, indeed. but that was just a particular point in my life. Yes. There was a curious kind of perfection about that relationship or the timing of that relationship. Yeah. And, and, well, being young and being in love, you know, that's... Of course, yes. Can't repeat that. Anything occurred to you, Tony? Well, a lot. I mean, yes. uh, 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 all sorts of questions, because yes. I'm interested in this issue of what it is that uh, enables people to survive. What do they draw on, and uh, listening to Terence Stamp, he talks about looking inside, drawing on your own reserves and, and resources. And there being nothing. And there being nothing. Others, if I were asked that, I, I draw very heavily on my, my wife and my children, on my, on my connections, on my uh, extended connections. Yes. And I think it's interesting that often I will ask patients or people who come to me in, in trouble what they derive their supports from uh, in times of crisis, in times of setback, such as you've d described. Uh, but you clearly are someone who has found it possible to be very independent. Well, I think that, you know, you, you, if you have a wife and children, um, what we're talking about is if you are deprived of your wife and children. That's right. Then where do you go? And ultimately, one is, one is in a body. One feels separate. You know, if you, I don't think that it's wise to depend on anything outside of you. Because everything outside of you is subject to change. You know, the only thing that is not subject to change is this feeling of being conscious that I remember when I was very small, seeing snow for the first time, going to somewhere new, having this bare feeling of consciousness which is the same today, if I, if I look at it now, it's the same. So it seems to me that that is the thing that is not subject to change. And in that sense, it's a unique, curious thing that I can't explain, but I'm sure interested in it. But it's a very individualistic view. I mean, I, I know Eastern psychiatrists who would say that is very much, in a sense, the mark of a Western psychology. Let me give you an example of what I mean. In this culture, many people, certainly I think in, 
in earlier years, many people here would derive a great deal of their sense of rootedness, their sense of themselves, through a complex web of relationships of parents, children, extended family. It's, it's, in a sense, we are surprisingly unaware of the extent to which what you've just described, very individualistic view of existence, has become the preeminent one. And it's one of the problems of present society, that we've got a lot of fractured people seeking meaning from inside themselves, which I think only a few people can manage, and you may be one of the rare ones. Sure, but if, for example, like, the world is on fire, right? I mean, there isn't a country where there isn't killing, terrorism, etc. Et so if, there's, if I really wanted to do something about that, if I really wanted to do something, if tomorrow I woke up, I thought, I want to do something about this, there is nothing that I can do other than take it upon myself to change myself. Because the world is, is the individual in a collected sense. I mean, they're all individuals. They're just in a room together. So they look like a crowd. So, so the world is me and you and gay in a collected sense, right? It's not anything other than that. I mean, if, if we have a box of matches and we tip them out, ah, it's one isn't match, it? isn't it? But you put a lot of them together, it's a box of matches. So if an individual takes it upon himself or herself to change themselves, in other words, to take themselves to task if they feel jealousy, anger, resentment, then if they can manage to bring about some fundamental transmutation within themselves, the world is different in the sense that a green tree with one yellow leaf on is, is different from a green tree. Only in their perception, surely. No, in fact. In fact. Because if there's a tree and it's green and one leaf turns yellow, the tree is not the same, is it? True. But, but uh, that's only one side of a complex equation, and I'm not disputing it. What I'm saying is we're not only matches in a box. Because while you see here an audience made up of, I don't know, 50, 60, 100 people, within that 100 people, some have relationships with each other, some quite close, some distant, some don't know each other at all. That what distinguishes human beings from matches, amongst other things, is that their identity is determined both in terms of their own immediate conscious understanding of themselves and their relationships with other people. And let sure. me just take your last point. When I look at the dreadful, you say the world is a fire and there's nothing I can do about it. That is what is currently depressing a lot of people. But of course, on this show and on radio and television, or indeed Britain or Europe, you also hear the extent to which people faced with that enormity nonetheless derive a considerable amount of identity from doing a little, from doing a little. If you say to me, solve Bosnia or shoot yourself, then I'm afraid you it's self-immolation. Right. But right. if you say, as I, look, look, I don't know what this audience is made up of, but I know that each of them in their own way, I suspect, is struggling to identify themselves first in terms of their own worth, which in turn is reflected by what they are contributing as parents, mothers, spouses, doctors, lawyers, TV producers. It doesn't really much matter as long as within, within a society, within that box of matches, people have the ability, or within that tree, the leaf on the tree is both an individual leaf an individual leaf, pure, perfect, and uh, 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 individual, but it's also connected to a tree. Sure. It's sure. connected to a tree. To the extent to which, in addition to being a leaf, you are connected to a tree. Well, I mean, you, I, I, I mean, the, at, at the level of at the level of consciousness, we are we are inseparable. You know, I think that. You mean now you're telling me all the box, all the matches in the boxes are intimately linked with each other? Yeah, of course. But it's like, but you know, it's like that that story that the, the as a man and woman get married, and he says, "Look, you know, I want you to understand this. I want you to know what you're getting into. When you're married, you take care of the small problems, and I'll take care of the big problems." And she says, "Well, what's that?" And he says, "Well, the little problems are like 
the rent, the cooking, the school fees. And she says, what are the big problems? And he says, well, you know, Vietnam and Yugoslavia. <laughs> I take care this, of those. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you can do something about you, you know. Yes. And I think that if, you, if you're taking that on board, if you're saying maybe there's something wrong with me and it's kind of not different with the world, then I can't change the world, but I can do something about me. Okay, uh, what I find uh, fascinating about you, Terence, is that uh, you, you went through all the, the heady bits of the 60s. You were into drink and drugs and women, and you sure had some hell of a life. Now you're right back to square one, insofar as I, I, I believe you lead a very frugal life and a very simple and straightforward life. Is that not so? And you've, you have eschewed uh, all of that sort of past thing. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's frugal. I mean, I guess I, it, it's quite austere compared with... What you were doing. What I was doing. Like you don't drink, for example. You're not big into booze uh, anymore. No, I mean, I have a drink occasionally. Sure, but, but you're not a boozer and you're... Yeah. You're, and, and are you vegetarian still? Yeah, well, I reintroduced fish a few years ago. I see, just fish. Yeah. And, and is this a sort of a rescue operation for the damage that you feel yeah. you, you did to your... Yeah, initially, yeah. I did a lot of, I mean, you know, when you do drugs and you drink, you do damage to your system, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think if, you know, if you're somebody who's, you're making part of the way you make your living is on your mechanism. You know, it's, it's how you look, it's whether you're in good shape or not. And those, that lifestyle started affecting me very negatively. And when I kind of realized this and I decided that I wanted to get straight, um, there was already damage done. There was damage done, you know, to my digestive system and stuff. And I had ulcers and I, and I had things that uh, had things, things wrong with me that I couldn't really cure in a traditional way, you know, by traditional medicine. Mm -hmm. and, and so I turned to alternative things. And, and I think now it's a kind of, um, I am healthy, but it's a question of prevention rather than cure. You know, I kind of, I prevent a lot of illnesses happen because I, because I'm very careful with, with my body. Do you think you'll ever get or no? Um, well, somebody asked me that the other day, and, and um, I have to say that I, I think I'm, um, I think I'm probably past my sell-by date, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Although one lives in hope. You know? Yes, and, and do you feel embarrassed at having been described in the 60s as the most desirable man? Um, it was hard for me to walk on after I heard you say that. <laughs> <laughs> but you're getting over it. I'm getting over you're it. You're getting over it. In one minute, could you tell me, Terence Stamp, The Night, the novel, in one minute, could you tell me what it is? It's a, is it comedic or is it... It's, you... Yeah, it's meant to be funny. It is meant to be funny. And, and it's, that's, the, that's the kind of, the ambiance of it is funny. It's a special night that's very curious, with very curious emanations coming from planets, making people slightly crazy. Giving a very strange ambiance to, to Britain. And during this night, it's an occasion for two souls, let's say twin souls, that have been together before, that have been searching for each other for lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And this is the night when they come together. And it's a night when they come together because of their history together. It's an occasion for them to use this energy and to do something for each other, which they're peculiarly equipped to do because of their, their long association. So that's the, the kind of main line. And the support line is just this how it's affecting everybody else. You know? Yeah, I see. Do you ever see Michael Caine now? Or you... Very occasionally. I mean, his, you know, his life and my life are really different. And, and uh, a lot of people say, well, he was your great mate. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's just that because Mike and I, what was strange about Mike and I was that we shared a place for years and we both became famous. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're kind of linked together like gin and tonic, you know. <laughs> But we're very different now, you know. But whenever I see him, it's nice. But 
um, whenever I see him, it's only like jokes and superficial. Yeah, there would be too much to talk about. Quite, you know. quite. I see. All right. You're a nice man, Terence Stanton. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed for coming in to see us. And the name of the book is The Night. <laughs> you are indeed. And Anthony Clare, it's always a pleasure to have you with us on any programme, no you. matter what. Well done. Well done. That's all we have for you then. Good night until next week. God bless you.